So uh, DNA is, is a very powerful experiment. Unfortunately, it's a very, very difficult experiment to do because uh, you might not have enough cells. And if you use DNA to cut and if the digestion, you know, the, the amount of DNAs you add versus the amount of cells you have, if you don't have the right balance, you could even chew up all the DNA into a single nucleotide. But if you don't digest enough, you may not have enough small fragments to sequence. And so it's a very, very tricky experiment. Um, later on, good thing is there's a new technology called a taxic. And so this one, basically, they are using a transposase that's adapt, you know, attached to a sequencing adapter. So you can see here, there is an enzyme called a TN5 transposase. And it actually has a sequence adapter directly uh, onto it. And so basically, this transposase can just in, like make a cut, insert itself onto the chromatin, and directly put sequencing adapters in there. That, so basically, all the, the DNA, you know, basically when it cuts, the sequencing adapter will be added to this location. Next time it go, it cuts, the sequencing adapter will be added to this location. And so, um, not only you will have the fragments, the fragments will already have the sequencing adapter to the end. And after that, you can just directly PCR amplify and go through sequencing. It's a very, very easy experiment to do, which is really great. And so with this, um, now people are able to use a taxi for, uh, even if you have a few hundred cells, a few hundred thousand cells. So for, for DNAs, you usually need millions of cells in order to do a, a DNA experiment. With a taxi, you can do this with a few hundred cells. And in fact, uh, after spring break, we have a lecture about single cell ataxy. You can even do a taxi experiment in a single cell, which is great. And this is an ex example they show. Uh, this is the DNA experiment that's uh, done uh, in the, uh, that you can see have good peaks, right? But, but here you have to use this cell in the millions of cells to do this experiment. Whereas um, when they do a taxi with only uh, 50,000 cells, you get good signal. Even if you use 500 cells, well, you know, you have a little bit noise, but you can still see the, the good peak signals in here. There is not, I don't think anybody can do robustly 500 cell DNA experiment. And so nowadays, uh, early days, there was only DNAs and only John Stam lab can do this experiment very well. But recent years, because of a taxi, the increase in a taxi experiment is, is really amazing, especially you can do this on tumor tissues, you do it in developmental tissues with only very few cells. Um, it's easier to do than transcription factor or a histomark chip seek. So the, this data is really accumulating very, very fast in the community. And, and so, oops, sorry. Uh, I, I, um, so so qu question is, uh, how do you analyze DNAs or taxi data? Uh, so if, if you know you have been in this lecture you've heard about you know, you've learned enough informatics when imagine a taxi first in, introduced to the world back in 2000 maybe 14 you get your first a taxi data here how do you analyze the data based on what you have learned anybody volunteering to do this I hope the students are still here. <laughs> um, the very first thing is uh, you can you know, do fast QC, quality control your reads. You map your reads to the genome using BWA, and then you want to call peaks right, using max, right? you get standard. And also, you want to probably make sure that your ataxy or DNA experiment, you get all those peaks, agree with whatever previous DNA peaks, right? To have good overlap and the peaks have good evolutionary conservation because those are supposedly important binding sites, right? So you can use standard chip CQC for all of this DNA stuff. What do you do next? Uh, with with a taxi, very often you do this in two different conditions, right? Disease, normal, uh, drug treatment, no treatment. You do a, a differentiation versus progenitor cells. You do it with knocking out the gene. So you also can call differential peaks, um, it, which will be part of your homework. 
And after that, you can do motif analysis from the peaks. You will do that also in the homework. At least you'll know roughly what family of transcription factor might be involved. Uh, but very often, um, they are, you know, the transcription factors that belong to the same family, for example, uh, STAT1, STAT2, STAT3, 4, 5A, 5B, STAT6, all bind to roughly the same motif. How do you know which one it is? Uh, very often, uh, you can look at gene expression to see which of these transcription factors in the family are the highest expressed. Uh, the other thing is you can ask uh, whether the, yeah, the transcription factor is differentially expressed in those two conditions. You can also try to assign all the nearby ataxic peaks or histomark peaks to the gene using this uh, regulatory potential. You, you weight by the distance from the peak to the gene and you assign the peaks and that will tell you roughly it kind of approximate how well this gene is expressed, even if you don't have gene expression data. And that can also help you roughly guess which member of that transcription factor might be more important in this cell type. Okay. Uh, and also the final task, well, the, the final resource that is developed in our lab is remember, we have a database called SystemDB, which we are collecting all the published ChIP-seq, all the public uh, DNAs, ATAC-seq, histomark together. And we have a function called the system DB, it's called the toolkit. Um, basically, you call your peaks or differential peaks, you, you upload your peaks in here. You can pick, you know, like uh, just get the top one. If you have a few thousand, it's easy. If you have too many, a hundred thousand, maybe that's too much. You get the, the top peaks or the top differential peaks, you upload them here and you say, okay, I just want to search for any other ChIP-seq data that's already in here. You'd submit this and in like a snap, it will tell you the following transcription factors have ChIP-seq peak that really overlap with those ataxic peak. It's actually a very good way to, to figure out what transcription factor really bind those to those locations. And so uh, as, a, yes. Oh, I have a question. So when you assign these peaks, um, Great for both the ataxic and the and the um, chip seek. When you, if the, especially if the peaks are really broad, how do you assign this peak is like for this gene or this peak belongs to the promoter of this gene or this peak belongs to the enhancer of this gene? Yeah. So uh, with uh, ataxic and the DNAs, the peak resolution is actually very good. Mm -hmm. It's usually a couple base pair, and so usually when another peak just even overlap with it for ten base pair or twenty base pair, you know it's the same peak. With but for histomarks. With you know, like a histone mark is usually a little harder, and so very often, you know, sometimes we even do something like this. You know, these are the K twenty seven acetylation peaks, right? It's pretty broad, mm -hmm. but exactly where is it binding? We overlap it with the DNAs. We say, you know, the peak might be long, but that the real binding is this two hundred base pair in the middle. Okay. And very often, what you will see is that when the DNAs is high. The K27 is high to the left, and there's a big 12, and it's high again to the right. And that really gives you an indication that the transcription factor is right in the middle. And so you can look at histone marks, but you over, very often use DNA to help you improve the resolution. Okay. But yeah. in terms of assigning this peak belongs to this gene. Oh, oh. so the peak belongs to this gene is, uh, usually we're talking about peaks that are 2 kb, uh, 50 kb versus 200 kb away from the gene. So for that, okay. the peak is, it doesn't really, the resolution is okay. Okay, then how do you assign that this, this peak belongs to, like, how do you know that, like, for example, this is happening for this gene, if you want to figure out which genes are being regulated, differentially yeah. regulated? So we, we do this for all the genes with, uh, if you go back to the chip C lecture, we weight all the genes with this exponential decay. Oh, okay. If it's, all right. if it's okay. right at the promoter, it's count as peak as one. If it's 10 kb away, it's already half. If it's even further away, you just kind of de decay the effect. Okay. And you get a roughly the expression. A okay. pretty reasonable approximation of whether this gene is important in the cell. Okay. Okay. And so with this uh, toolkit, if you have DNA's peak, a differential peak, you just run this it will very quickly tell you which transcription factors are important. Okay, so um, to summarize, you can think, you know, this epigenetics is just landmark allowing you to figure out which locations are important. DNA isolation is kind of a permanent silent. You want this region to be really off, covered up. Repressive histomark is usually, oh, you know, I temporarily I needed this to be off a little bit in, in the repeat region. 
when it needs to be silent, very often initially it's the K9 trimethylation, but if it's a long-term thing, you'd use DNA methylation to really lock it up. Um, for polymerase, you know, to go into this region, you have very big chunk of nucleosome free region because many transcription factors really converge on that. And the nearby nucleosomes are very well positioned. And a lot of the transcription factor binding sites also, once they are binding there, the nearby nucleosomes are better positioned and they also have better, more histomers and they kind of wave the flags to tell other transcription factors. I'm open, come to here. And so you can imagine basically when you use transposase or a DNAs, they are just like a transcription factor. They go to cell, where do I go? They go to the open mark location and they go there to cut. That's why you can get those important regions out very quickly. And so, um, yeah, so, so basically epigenetics is our, our beacons in the genome. They are active histomarks and you can use it to annotate functional elements in the genome, identify new genes, use their dynamics to figure out what transcription factor binds there and how they might regulate genes. If you don't know a priori which transcription factors are important, and you can also use them to tell you, ah, this gene is being actively uh, reinforced using epigenetics. These usually are important genes in the genome. And uh, with uh, DNAs and ataxy, now we get the collection again of all the binding sites with higher resolution. But in terms of predicting which transcription factor binds there, be careful about this footprint. And uh, you can see, you know, this basically in the embryonic stem cell, there are some initial epigenetics, but these marks are being added and dynamically maintained. So every cell based on DNA methylation, based on histone, based on available uh, chromatin accessibility, determine where the cell really goes. And they, they kind of keep the door open, they keep the regions open for correct transcription factors to bind. And so I would say transcription factors are the kinetic energy, whereas epigenetics are the potential energy. They kind of, it's chicken and egg, they help each other. Epigenetic landscape is established by all the available transcription factor in that cell. But once the epigenetics are established, they influence how a transcription factor would bind and how they in, it, regulate gene expression. And of course, again, in cancer is like, oh, it got stuck in some crazy epigenetic st status and then it can't get out, right? So it's a, once you understand uh, uh, this, um, we would say transcription and epigenetics is chicken and egg, uh, you should always look at epigenetics in the context of transcription gene regulation, and then you will understand this much better. Okay, that's good for today. Thank you. So it, I think this Zoom meeting actually works pretty well. Uh, we were just informed after spring break, all the classes have to be remote. I think this is a trial run. It works pretty well. Well, we'll try that uh, from now on. Okay, thank you. Have a good day. It's crazy.